Welcome and thank you for all attending the first in the 2022 series of online events around ground preparation basics, um, which is hosted by the EMHS Research Hub. My name is Sharon Humphreys. I'm the relatively new Director of Innovation and Research um, at EMHS. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country uh, throughout Australia. Uh, we recognise their contributing connection to land, waters and community, and we pay our respects to their culture and their elders past and present. Um, moving on to some housekeeping notes, um, there is a QA and a button uh, that should be available and should be visible at the top of your screen. Um, you can type in a question throughout the um, throughout the, um, the presentation um, and um, at the end, uh, Professor uh, Daniel Favich will facilitate a QA. and um, I'd like to introduce you to our first speaker today, um, Dr Julie Glover, the Executive Director of Research Foundations from the National Health and Medical Research Council. Dr Glover's team manages NHMRC's largest research funding schemes, coordinates peer review training activities, produces research impact case studies and manages NHMRC's grants and funding arrangements with research institutes. Dr Glover completed a PhD in the Faculty of Science at the Australian National University and held research positions into joining the Bureau of R Rural Sciences in 2002. In 2007, Dr Glover moved to the Innovation Division of the Australian Government Department of Industry and spent four years developing and delivering key innovation policies. Dr Glover joined NHMRC as a director in 2011. Julie is going to provide some information about the NHMRC and the types of funding schemes available. Over to you Julie. Thanks very much Sharon. I'll just uh, share my screen which we practiced just before. It should work. How's that? Yep, that's good. Excellent. Um, look, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak here today. Um, just before I start, I wanted to mention that we're currently in caretaker. So because of the election um, as public servants, we are unable to comment on, on government policy. So I just wanted to make sure I started with that. Um, just moving, I'm just going to give a little bit of background about NHMRC and our strategy. I won't spend too much time on this, but just to put us in the context, um, we have a strategy which is underpinned across uh, three main themes. We have a theme of uh, investment in research, translation of research, and as well as maintaining a strong integrity framework, which underpins research across Australia. Um, so today I'm really just going to focus on around our investment. Um, so our strategy around investment is to fund the highest quality health and medical research and researchers. Uh, we have a special funding account which is called the Medical Research Endowment Account, which has around $900 million of uh, new funding each year. Um, we fund research from uh, all, all sorts of uh, environments, so from the laboratory to the clinic and the community. And most of our research is investigator initiated, uh, so it is mostly bottom up. Um, there are some targeted or top, top down priority set uh, schemes, but most of our schemes are generic schemes and researchers set the, the priorities and the targets uh, through their own research plans that they submit in through to the schemes. We provide uh, support for projects and people, so individual teams, networks, works um, and we are complementary to the Medical Research Future Fund and our next speaker, Sarade, will talk a little bit more about that. Um, we're really focused on building and maintaining the foundation of Australian health and medical research capability and capacity and we have the overarching goal across our schemes of improving human health. Um, the next slide gives a bit of a snapshot of our funding programs. So 
Um, we have a suite of funding programs, as I've mentioned, around $900 million a year. Um, this slide shows a little bit about some of the schemes. Uh, we have a new suite of schemes, some of which were developed um, and opened in 2019. So these are the ones that are on the left of the slide, investigator grants, synergy grants and ideas grants. Um, and we also have a new clinical trials and cohort study scheme, which um, started up in 2019. We have a suite of other strategic and leveraging grant schemes um, I'll talk a, uh, about a few of those. Uh, some examples you may be familiar with are Centres of Research Excellence, Partnership Projects and Targeted Calls for Research. This slide shows uh, the approximate allocation of the funding across the scheme. So you can see where the, where the sort of big volume of, of funding is going out. Um, and you can also see um, across the bottom there, approximate numbers of grants that have gone out uh, over the years of the scheme. So um, I wanted to just say about this slide is that each of the schemes have detailed uh, grant opportunity guidelines or rules um, which specify what, what uh, NHMRC is looking for in those schemes and how the process will work. And they're very much the, the documents to, to delve into if you're interested in applying. Um, just a snapshot of how funding is allocated uh, across the NHMRC schemes. So the, the approximate budget for each of the schemes is set annually in advance on advice from our research committee and council. Um, uh, we go through the application and peer review process. Um, our peer reviewers are independent assessors. Um, some schemes have grant review panels where we bring the peer reviewers together to discuss shortlisted applications. Uh, but, and then in general, the scores are used to generate ranked lists and uh, we start at the top and, and fund down those ranked lists until the funding runs out. Um, equally ranked applications are all funded, so sometimes we get uh, multiple applications on the same score. Um, and in some areas, we also have structural priority budgets. So we have additional funding which is set aside for really high quality near miss uh, applications in defined priority areas. And our current priority areas are Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Research, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Researchers and female chief investigators. So um, when we sort of asked about what, what you know, how the, what's the best way and how to um, get the best outcomes for success for NHMRC's grant program, the I guess we have very strong themes coming through from our peer reviewers. Um, the, the best thing to do is remember, look at the objectives and the purpose of the scheme and um, really familiarise yourself, uh, as I've mentioned, with the grant guidelines for those particular schemes. So we, uh, as, as an Australian government agency, our grant guidelines are released through Grant Connect, um, which is a government service that you can register for and it alerts you to um, schemes. If you can, you can put keyword searches in and it will alert you to schemes that may be of interest to you. Um, so I'd highly recommend getting an account for Grant Connect. Um, we, our grant management system is Sapphire. And again, you'll need to submit applications through Sapphire. Um, when we have schemes open and the grant guidelines are out, we often get questions and, and sometimes these are things that are pretty easy and uh, to address and other times they're things that we may not have uh, thought about or they may not be covered clearly in the guidelines. So if that happens, we do release uh, frequently asked questions uh, through the opening of the scheme. So if you're registered on Grant Connect, you will receive those FAQs as they come out. And your research administration officers um, are also really familiar with that process. Um, another way I think to be for people to be familiar with our schemes is to participate in the peer review process. So I know there'll be people on this um, on this call who are who have been peer reviewers and I thank you for your contribution. Uh, if you are interested in in but, um, undertaking peer review. Uh, we do have a range of schemes and a range of uh, different levels that, that we require. So um, certainly think about putting your name forward for that. Um, we have 
both in uh, universities and other administrative institutions have internal deadlines. Uh, it's really important to meet those. The research administration officers, they like they do a lot of quality control and also like to check that your application is eligible. So they can only do this if you um, if people submit in time for them to look through. Um, the uh, other we also have deadlines, very strict deadlines. Um, so it's really important to be aware of those. We off, schemes often have minimum data deadlines. So that means that uh, usually about a month or a little bit more into a scheme's opening period, uh, we need to find out how many applications they're going to receive and what is the content area that they'll be in so that we can start making sure we have the right peer reviewers on, on board. Um, so we have what's called a minimum data cutoff. So if you haven't started your application by that time, you won't be able to submit in that opening period. So it's worth knowing about that as well. Um, there's a lot of people, you, you know, applicants and mentors that can help you with your application um, and just sort of some tips there on making sure you seek advice from your RAO uh, mentors and colleagues. Um, exactly like a job application, make sure you get other people to read and, and make sure it all makes sense. So it's really important that you can get um, help with those things. I thought I would just give um, a, an overview of some of the schemes and a bit of a snapshot of the key information that's available so that you can know where, where to look um, and, and some of the tips and tricks about applying for those particular schemes. So I'll start with investigator grants, which is um, really, I guess, our fellowship scheme, which supports the research program of individuals, but it also uh, contains a uh, project funding uh, um, to support uh, teams as well. Um, it's designed to be flexible to support new research directions as they arise and for people to form collaborations as they go along. Um, the, these research grants are for five years. They're across different levels. So we have emerging leadership level one, emerging leadership level two. Both of those are within 10 years of your PhD. And then there's leadership levels uh, one, two and three. And there's descriptors on the sort of typical um, research experience that would be required at those different levels, um, which is in the applications. Um, each of NHMRC schemes has selection criteria, so they are the um, the criteria on which the uh, peer reviewers score. Um, and this is, just gives an example of what the investigator grants um, selection criteria and the weightings are. So it's very much a track record based scheme, publications, research impact and leadership. Um, you may be interested, we've just uh, bit previously to this year, people had to supply um, all of their publications over the last 10 years for this scheme. We've now changed uh, that um, to focus more on quality and not quantity. So um, a key change for investigator for this year is that it's up to 10 um, publications. So you only need to put in your on your application uh, 10 publications and you need to set out why you've chosen those publications and your role in those publications. So that's very much a big policy shift for NHMRC, really trying to emphasise um, that we want people to focus on quality of their outputs, not quantity. Um, some of the key documents that are available for applicants to have a look at um, and to make themselves familiar with are um, there's, uh, I've already mentioned Grant Connect, uh, Investigator Grant Guidelines, so they're basically the rules for the scheme. Um, there's also a document that is called Key Characteristics of Investigator Grant Applications. So what this document is, is that we received, sought and uh, received feedback from peer reviewers from previous rounds about what makes a good uh, investigator grant application and the, the opposite to that, what, what where did people um, score not so well on their investigator grant application. So it's very much um, sort of general feedback, but very useful when you're putting your applications together to make sure that you've addressed those sort of key issues that peer reviewers are looking for in, in a good application. Um, some of the other documentation that applicants find very useful are the peer review guidelines. So these are the 
documents that we give to the peer reviewers to um, explain to them what we're looking for, what NHMRC is looking for, what we're asking them to assess, how we're asking them to assess it. It includes, as well as the grant guidelines, also include the category descriptors, which are the descriptions of what uh, your application needs to demonstrate to get a particular score. Um, so that material is available, even though it's for peer reviewers, it's also available on our website um, or in the on the Grant Connect package um, so that you can um, become familiar with those. Another thing that uh, is new last year, which we think that applicants might find of interest is we released um, some uh, peer review mentor videos. So these are videos where we have experienced peer reviewers uh, talking to um, the audience is, is generally peer reviewers, explaining to them things to look for, uh, how to undertake their peer reviews, tips and tricks on undertaking peer review. And some of the information in those videos can be quite useful for applicants as well. It gives you a bit of an insight into what peer reviewers are looking for. Um, as always, your first point of call with uh, any applications would be your administering institutions RAO. Um, they are usually very knowledgeable about our schemes, and if they don't, if there's anything that gets asked of them that they they don't understand, they um, they know that they can come straight through to NH and MRC. Um, just as I mentioned before, we have frequently asked questions that are released uh, often as the scheme is open and go through the opening period. Um, if you do ask a question of your RAO and it's taking a little while for them to get back to you, it's probably because we are pushing it through as an FAQ and we want to make sure that we give the answer to all of the applications, all of the applicants in the round. So um, just, just, just to let you know, that's what will be happening with that, is that we'll be looking, making sure that we can answer that question for all the applicants so they have the information to hand. Um, there are eligibility rules around our schemes. Um, all schemes have eligibility rules, but there is. It's important uh, with some of the new schemes. There are uh, caps on the number of applications that you can put in. There's intersection uh, between some of the schemes, so um, you can only put in two applications in in a round across investigator ideas and synergy, for example. Um, so those are the sorts of things that the RAOs look for, but there are tools on our website to help you understand whether you're eligible and also to check um, the grants that your fellow applicants may hold because that it's important to check their eligibility as well, because if they're in a, if anyone is ineligible on a grant application, it can a result in the withdrawal of the whole application, um, which no one really wants um, to have happen. Um, there are tools in Sapphire as well. There's an application count dashboard, um, which gives you an indication if you are, uh, if you have too many applications in a round, um, it, it can um, signal that to you. Um, this is some example of, as I mentioned, some of the feedback that comes through from peer reviewers about what uh, they find as common characteristics of high scoring applications. Um, this was particular feedback on the investigator grant um, round uh, scheme. Uh, so very much um, you'll see these uh, again, there is a very strong um, theme through all of the schemes that we do this for um, that encouraging people to write their applications, not necessarily for the most expert person in their field. You need to make sure that you limit the use of jargon, limit the use of discipline specific terminology, or ex at the very least explain that so that the application is uh, understandable by pe from people from a broader research, co research cohort. Um, we do try and get the closest match that we can uh, for um, peer reviewers to the research proposal, um, but we also have conflict of interest provisions. And so if you think about it, if you if you work in a very niche field, um, most of you probably collaborate with most of the researchers in Australia in that field and they may be conflicted on your application. So um, it's just worthwhile and this would apply across all sorts of research. Um, is really to make sure that you uh, pitch the research proposal for an 
not an expert, for a researcher who is maybe just outside of your field. There's some other tips there around, which are specific to investigate a grant, um, which are useful. Um, the opposite to this, as I mentioned, is that we uh, have examples from peer reviewers or uh, comments from them about what are the sort of things that mean that uh, the application scores uh, less well. And you can see that it's often about clarity of writing, uh, clarity of the research that's being proposed, uh, not addressing the, um, the actual criteria, the, the criteria for the scheme, because that's what the peer reviewers are scoring against. And there's also a common theme that comes in through the peer reviewers about ensuring that your application is cohesive um, and demonstrates a, a cohesive sort of picture of the research you have planned. Um, another scheme which uh, is uh, a lot of uh, people apply for and, and supports uh, research across all sorts of areas of um, research in Australia is the Ideas Grant Scheme. It's very much looking for innovative and creative research. It's funding of all researchers at all career stages and any area of health and medical research. Um, the, main, the main caveat around Ideas Grant is the exclusion that if you are um, undertaking a clinical trial or a cohort study, uh, ideas grants is not the scheme. Uh, clinical trials and cohort studies is the scheme as, um, for that, as well as there are other schemes through NHMRC and MR MRFF for clinical trial work. Again, some tips uh, around uh, ideas grants applications. Uh, there's a really common theme, becoming familiar with the grant guidelines. Uh, look for mentors, look at what assessors will be, look, assessors will be looking for, and um, clearly explain how your research proposal is innovative um, to ensure that it's clear and easy to read outside of your area. Um, Again, with ideas grants, we've had feedback from peer reviewers about what makes good applications. Uh, so um, just um, here's the four assessment criteria. So for ideas grants, as well as the gen generic feedback from peer reviewers, we also have asked them what makes an application score highly against each of the individual criteria. Um, so here's some generic sort of feedback um, on ideas grants, which again, uh, very similar to some of the feedback on investigator grants. Um, one, one key thing I'll pull out from this slide is that uh, it's important that applications are written for the ideas grant scheme, not repurposed from other schemes. So peer reviewers notice that as well. Uh, again, some uh, feedback from peer reviewers, uh, very much along the lines of people not following instructions, uh, not adequately addressing the assessment criteria. So um, important things as, as checklists to, to check for your application before it's submitted. And as I mentioned, this is the sort of feedback um, that we get. I've just drawn out one of the criteria, research quality, um, and this slide shows some of the feedback that's given on applications that scored well against this criterion, um, as opposed to applications that didn't score as well. Um, so again, it's around logical, cohesive arguments, um, anticipating peer reviewer questions or risks that maybe may come up in the research and addressing those in your proposal um, and explaining how you manage those risks um, as, they come along, as they come along. Um, uh, some other schemes that may be of interest, I'll, I'll just flag. Um, I know we had some questions beforehand about um, the sorts of research that might be supported through schemes. Partnership projects is a small but very important scheme in our suite of schemes. It's about translating research evidence into health policy and health practice to really imp improve health services and processes. Um, so it's designed to specifically um, support that sort of uh, project. And again, um, researchers can set the priorities. Uh, you need to have partners on board for these projects as the name suggests. So definitely a scheme to look at. It's open all year round. Uh, we have three, um, we batch the peer review processes in three, in three rounds but through the year. Um, another scheme uh, I've touched on briefly, clinical trials and cohort studies, as the name suggests, um, 
is to fund that sort of research. Uh, we fund around 30 grants per year. Um, so it's about 7.5% of the medical research endowment account. There are also a number of targeted calls for research uh, that are released through NHMRC through the year. Um, I just thought it would be worth mentioning how targeted, how the topics for targeted calls come to us. So uh, we have a range of uh, different mechanisms where targeted calls come through. They can be proposed by Australian government agencies who usually come with funding um, that they commit to those targeted calls. Uh, we also have a state, territory and Commonwealth uh, TCR working group where health officials and policy officials from the, health, from the Commonwealth, state and territories um, can put forward uh, suggestions for topics of research that are needed mm -hmm. to inform the, um, their various uh, jurisdictions. Um, we also have uh, a community research po uh, priorities portal where community and professional groups, not researchers, but um, other sorts of professional groups can put forward ideas for priorities and they and these come through to NHMRC for assessment. We also have council and committees, which I've mentioned. Those um, committees can suggest topics for TCRs. The, all of these suggestions for topics, they go into a, a, a sort of decision uh, pot and we make decisions on those uh, TCR topics throughout the year. So we have around $20 million a year allocated to TCRs um, and we also have a suite of international schemes and often they um, intersect with some of the TCRs where there are priority areas which have been identified by international partners which are also of priority interest to Australia. Um, just finally, just a, a, a little bit of plug, I guess, for peer review. So our funding decisions are all pace, based on impartial and expert advice. Uh, we have peer reviewers who are researchers, peer reviewers who are clinicians, peer reviewers who are community experts, um, and, and we also have community observers. So there's a large range of roles in the community in the peer review process, um, and we really welcome nominations for peer reviewers. If you are a peer reviewer for NHMRC or if you do have a Sapphire account, we highly recommend that you update your profile data, which is your description of your research areas and your skill sets. Um, if those are up to date, that gives you the best uh, chance of being nominated for peer review and also being given applications that match your area. Um, so I just uh, wanted to say thank you for the opportunity for speaking and thanks for the organisers and really happy to um, answer questions. I think the idea is that we answer, Sarade and I both answer questions together. And I'll stop sharing. Thanks so much, Julie. Um, that was a wonderful um, a presentation with some really um, useful information. Um, I'll now introduce our second speaker, Dr. Saray Billiards, um, who'll give us a rundown on the Medical Research Future Fund. Uh, Saray is a director in the Health and Medical Research Office, the Department of Health. Uh, the HMRO manages the $20 million MRF effort. MRFF. Um, as part of her role, Saray is responsible for the management and implementation of RMF missions. Prior to joining the department, Saray was the Head of Strategy and Engagement Science in Australia Gender Equity at the Australian Academy of Science, where she was responsible for implementing the Athena Swan accreditation framework. Sarade has extensive grants management experience, having worked at NHMRC for several years where she was responsible for managing and delivering several funding schemes, including project grants, development grants and international collaborations with an annual budget of approximately 500 million. Um, Sarade was also responsible for NHMRC's Women in Health Science Committee. Uh, she has a PhD in neurophysiology from Monash University. After completing her PhD in 2003, Sarade worked for five years in the Department of Neuropathology at Harvard Medical School, focusing on perinatal brain injury, with a particular focus on cerebral palsy and stillbirth. Um, upon her return to Australia, she continued her research at Melbourne University before taking up her, her position at NHMRC. Um, I'll now hand over to Sarade. 
Thank you, Sharon, and um, thanks. I'll just reiterate Julie's thanks for inviting us to this presentation, and um, we hope that you'll find this useful. And uh, as with all presentations, I think the Q&A session at the end will be um, probably the most useful for most people. Um, so Julie really covered off on a lot of um, similarities, if you like, between NHMRC and the MRFF in terms of what we would consider makes a good application. So I'm not going to really revisit those. Um, in addition, uh, Julie also covered some of the, the administrative components of where to find grant opportunity guidelines and so forth. So um, we're pretty much the same um, in terms of how we get that information out there. But what I will do is um, just talk a little bit about the MRFF and for some people, it's a little bit unclear um, in terms of how the MRFF is different to the NHMRC. And so I'll just give you a brief overview. So um, the MRFF hasn't been around for very long, so we're, we're still relatively in our infancy. So it's about seven years or so. But one of the key or some of the key differences with the MRFF um, compared to, for example, the NHMRC and other funding agencies is that um, we are relatively flexible and responsive and we're priority led. So all of our grant opportunities are completely priority led as opposed to investigator led. And um, and this is demonstrated out through um, our ability to be able to be quite responsive to um, emerging priorities, for example, COVID and bushfires. Our areas of focus through the MRFF for funding is on areas of unmet need or a technology with transformational potential. So this is where the priority led component comes in. We are particularly outcome focused and I'll talk a little bit more about this with um, regard to the actual grant opportunity guidelines. But we aim to try to bring together through the grant calls that we put out a varied group of individuals to participate in the research, but we also have this a bit like what Julie mentioned in terms of the assessment of the applications. So we try to bring that diverse group of um, individuals. What might make us a little bit different in that we do try to engage health systems and health services um, professionals as well, um, as well as industry. Um, it's, it's a key focus for the MRFF. One of the key components of the MRFF is to try to harness resources across the system. And this is demonstrated through, for example, our missions where we have a roadmap and an implementation plan, which identifies key areas for collaboration where we can leverage off existing funding, expertise and so forth. And we also try to use innovative models through the MRFF. So depending upon the nature of the research call, um, we'll um, ultimately direct the type of research model that we use or grant model that we use for the uh, grant opportunities. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later as well. So as I mentioned, this is just a quick snapshot of the MRFF. So we haven't been around for too long, but you'll be able to see from the figure on the left that we started off relatively small, only about $20 million, and we're just starting to reach sort of our peak, which is approximately $650 million annually. And um, our, our budget is really um, determined and the funding of MRFF is determined by a number of key guidance documents and, um, and key legislation. So this just gives you a brief snapshot of what sort of drives the MRFF. And I know a lot of people have questions about how the grant opportunities and the priority areas are identified. And hopefully this will give you a bit of an idea for that. So um, we operate under the MRFF Act, which is the legislation that we need to abide by. And then underpinning that is what we call the, the strategy. And that really outlines how the MRFF fits within the broader health and medical research and the health system. Then sitting underneath that are the priorities, and these are really the areas that we have identified through consultation and through our um, Australian Medical Research Advisory Board. What are the key areas of um, investment that the MRFS should be focusing on over the next 10 years? We have a 10 year plan which articulates the um, forward estimates of the budgets that uh, are against the various initiatives that sit underneath 
the MRFF, and this is slightly different perhaps to what NHMRC does, where we have it um, moving forward. So it's a it's, it's a pretty much a, a, a consistent view across the next 10 years of what our budget will look like. And we also have the um, evaluation strategy, which um, is designed to, at the macro level, to evaluate how the MRFF is going and also at the micro level, how individual grants are tracking against the objectives and outcomes of specific grant opportunities. So I won't go into these in too much detail, but as I mentioned, the um, the strategy or the Australian Medical Research and Innovation Strategy um, that's currently in place um, up until 2020, uh, 2026 was developed by AMRAV following extensive stakeholder consultation. And so really um, it's underpinned by strategic objectives and also guiding principles um, to support the strategy. As I mentioned, underpinning this are the priorities and the priorities that we currently have published are still in draft form, but they will um, come into effect later this year. And these priorities really try to align and facilitate the achievement of the strategy, um, of the strategy's uh, vision, aim and its strategic objectives. And so these innovation priorities really are sort of the backbone, if you like, of um, the development of grant opportunities and the identification of particular areas within those opportunities. And as you can see, there's quite a lot here. And um, if you want to delve into this a little bit further on our website, you'll see that we have these priorities and um, it also has a, a why and the how. So why we've got these, why we have identified these priorities and how we're going to implement the priorities. So as I mentioned, um, we have a 10 year investment plan, which really articulates the, um, the investment of the MRFF over the next 10 years. And this covers the full spectrum of the MRFF. Um, so the MRFF has four themes, patients, researchers, research missions, and research translation. And up until the budget, um, we had 20 initiatives that sat underneath those four themes. And um, since the budget announcement, um, Earlier this year, uh, we have added an additional initiative to the MRFF. And so the current um, new investment plan, which is the second 10 year investment plan, um, articulates the investment strategy of $6.3 billion over the next 10 years. What it does is it, it retains and carries all funding that was, um, was already present in the first 10 year investment plan. And as I mentioned, um, the existing 20 initiatives are still current, but we have a new initiative which is supporting, it's a specific focus on supporting early to mid-career researchers and $384.2 million has been allocated to this initiative. For the existing initiatives, there are um, a range of those initiatives which have been enhanced and expanded and th that listing is here. And then um, we've just also extended the investment strategy for the remaining um, initiatives. So the update um, of the 10 year plan or the second um, 10 year plan investment um, really um, also demonstrates the alignment with the strategy and priorities. And so this will show that underneath all of the priorities listed on the left hand side of this table, how the 21 initiatives through the MRFF really link back to those priorities. I'll just mention um, missions in particular. So the missions are also not only guided by the strategy and the priorities, but they're also guided by a roadmap and an implementation plan, which have been developed through consultation and with the advice of an expert advisory panel. And these are really important documents if you're um, in the fields of research that underpin those missions. And so there are eight missions and they range from genomics health, the genomics health futures mission through to traumatic brain injury and indigenous health research fund. And the reason why I highlight 
this is that the particularly in the implementation plan of the majority of the missions that um, have the implementation plan in place, it articulates the priority areas for investment in the short, medium and long term. And what you'll see is that what's identified as the priority areas are directly translatable to what you will see in the Grant Opportunity Guidelines. So if you are in those fields and for some, the short term priority areas have already been met through existing or um, older Grant Opportunities. Um, but for those where we're starting to hit the medium and longer term priority areas for investment, you will start to see those coming through in future grant opportunities that will become published over the coming years. And lastly, I just um, the, the last sort of guidance document that really underpins the MRFF is, as I mentioned, is the um, performance and evaluation framework. And this really tries to articulate at the macro and micro level um, the impact of the MRFF MRFF against eight key measures of success, and I won't go into the detail of these, but what is expected is that through various grants and at the higher level that the MRFF will have an impact across the eight measures of success in various ways. So um, going on to applying for MRFF grants, as I mentioned, um, there's a lot of overlap between what Julie has said and what's important in terms of um, key tips and hints for writing applications for MRFF funding. Um, MRFF funding and the administration of the grant opportunities are either um, done, is either done through the NHMRC or through Business Grants Hub, which is through the Department of Industry. And the identification of which grant opportunities go with which um, grants hub is largely determined by the type of research that we are asking for. And so, and this comes down to sort of the theme, as I mentioned earlier, we have the four themes and now the 21 initiatives. So unlike the NHMRC where they have schemes which um, occur on an annual basis for the majority of their programs, most of the MRFF grant opportunities uh, are, if you like, one-offs. And so it is quite difficult to give a really good overview of what makes a strong application through the MRFF because it is priority led. However, there are some really, um, you know, key examples that we can give that sort of, you know, try to articulate the importance of the things that you need to consider. And so what's really important when you are applying for an MRFF grant is don't treat um, each grant opportunity as the same. Each grant opportunity will be different. So look beyond the title um, and look to the objectives and the outcomes um, for that particular grant opportunity. Look at the eligibility criteria, which can vary between the grant opportunities and also look at the selection criteria. And I mentioned this as well because it relates to the last point on this slide, which is the MRFF grant models, where we do have um, various assessment. Um, or we may have changes in the assessment criteria depending upon the nature of the grant model. So each grant opportunity will align with the um, uh, priorities that are in force and it also must um, meet the objectives within the initiative that it sits. So for example, primary care um, grant opportunities must have a focus um, of that, that sits underneath the primary um, health care initiative. Within each of our grant opportunities, applicants are also not only are they required to um, showcase their research idea, the methodology, the track record of the team, but they also need to identify how their research will contribute to the MRFF measures of success. And, and this is quite a different concept um, in terms of applying for um, funding. And it's really critical that you identify what measure of success, it could be one, it could be more, and articulate this in the application. Um, each grant opportunity has assessment criteria that are focused on outcomes. So this is also quite important in the way you um, pitch the application. So it's on the impact of the research that you're proposing and that ties in then to the methodology and the other assessment criteria. Um, we have four assessment criteria. The first three, impact methodology, capacity, capability and resources. Um, 
are assessed quantitatively. And then our fourth criterion, overall value and risk, is a qualitative assessment. And the overall value and risk is one where um, you need to demonstrate not only the importance of the research that you are putting forth, but also the budget that you have put forth, is it um, value for money? And also, have you demonstrated that you are able to, um, or you have contingencies in place for potential risks that come up through the nature of research? Um, and just quickly, I'll touch a little bit on the grant models. And um, at the moment, we have four different grant models through the MRFF. And within some grant opportunities, you may see that there's only one grant opportunity, um, one grant model, sorry. But within some of our grant opportunities, we have all four. So it's really um, important that you identify the, the grant model that you're also applying for. And the grant models will vary from what we call our incubators, which are the very sort of more small scale, um, just trying to build up an idea. And so they're no more than two years in duration through to our accelerator um, grant models, which are up to about five years, much bigger um, in terms of the budget. And they're supposed to be quite um, large interdisciplinary teams um, that put forth applications under that grant model. So um, the key considerations that our assessors will be looking for when they are looking at the applications that are submitted for any of our MRF MRFF grant opportunities is really um, one of the, the key things is does the application that's been submitted address the objectives and the outcomes within that grant opportunity? And as I mentioned, there may um, be multiple objectives and outcomes. So it's really critical that you understand which one that you're applying to, but also you um, reflect that within your application. And unfortunately, we do see a lot of um, very, very good quality applications coming through and being assessed. And whilst based on the science, um, they are fantastic applications, but when we bring it back to the objectives and the outcomes of that particular grant opportunity, um, they won't succeed. Um, we also ask, as I said, to look at the measures of success um, that's outlined in the monitoring, evaluation and learning strategy. And this really feeds into the project impact and the overall value and risk criteria for the um, project. And also the intention is set out for the grant model, and this is important for the methodology section. So this just gives you a bit of a snapshot. Um, this is pretty much um, applicable for all grant opportunities. So the, the way you submit your application um, will have the, the different fields which will be applicable across all of the grant opportunities. And this gives you a bit of an idea against each assessment criterion where the fields are within that application that are really critical and what the assessors are going to be looking at to make their judgment about the quality of the application um, within each criterion. Um, as I mentioned, it's, it's really hard for us to be able to uh, give advice on sort of um, good quality applications as often our grant opportunities are one-offs. But Based on the last couple of years, and this won't be too dissimilar to um, funding through NHMRC, we, we ask that when you're preparing your application, you look at the um, assessment criteria and the associated matrices, and ideally you want to be achieving at a minimum a five across all of the assessment criteria. And ideally, if you can pitch higher, um, that's even better. Um, the, the field's very competitive, and, um, and so we do suggest that these are, are good um, benchmarks to look at when you're submitting and finalising the application. So um, this is just a little bit of an update um, for those who may not be um, fully across the types of grant opportunities that are available through the MRFF. And so um, late last year, there were a number of grant opportunities, 13 in total, that were announced. Um, and some of these have closed, but it just gives you a bit of an overview of the, I guess, the, um, the breadth of grant opportunities that we currently have. And they span across a number of initiatives from the early to mid career researcher initiative through to national critical research infrastructure. Um, 
We've also had another 17 new grant opportunities that were announced in the budget. And I know this is a very busy um, table, but this is quite important in that these are all grant opportunities that are currently open. And for those of you who are watching, if any of these grant opportunities and the areas of focus are within your um, areas of specialty, um, please look into these and consider these and apply for these um, grants where you can. Um, one, um, Sharon and the organisers uh, indicated to us that um, there perhaps is um, there's a lot of early to mid career, career researchers who are on the line watching this presentation, as well as some um, a lot of um, clinical academics. And so I just wanted to highlight um, a couple of grant opportunities in particular that may be of relevance um, or of interest to you. So there's the um, the new 2021 early to mid career researchers grant opportunity. Um, it closes in July. It has the several grant models that I talked about. Um, and the, the really interesting and unique um, component of this particular grant opportunity was or is that it was developed in consultation with early mid-career researchers. So um, we held workshops to try to identify what the needs were and this has come out of those workshops. So um, this is sort of one of the several ways of trying to generate um, ground opportunities through consultation that um, still fall into alignment with the strategy and the priorities of the MRFF. And also we have um, the new clinician researchers, which, which is specifically targeted towards nurses, midwives and allied health. And this is a 20 plus million dollar grant opportunity um, and it will close uh, in August. So um, just, just for sort of a, the last couple of slides, I just wanted to also encourage you to partake in consultations uh, that the MRFF um, often engages with. And so the AMRAP, so our board, will be consulting in the coming months on a number of areas, including uh, consumer and clinician involvement in research. And if this is something that is um, appealing to you, we encourage you to be involved in those cons consultations. We'll also be con um, consulting on the health and medical research workforce development, as well as research quality. And between AMRAB and NHMRC Council, um, we have regular engagement and focus on making sure that we work together and consider alignment and complementarity where we can, and also engagement with the community. Um, it's a continuous feedback loop. Um, we're always um, listening and we're always trying to identify gaps in funding so we can um, identify new funding opportunities. And this comes through uh, uh, you know, numerous mechanisms. And so these consultations and so forth are really critical. Um, if you haven't already, there are a number of ways to keep connected uh, with the MRFF and we have um, a monthly newsletter so you can subscribe to that and the details are here. As Julie mentioned, we can't get the assessment of our applications done without the, the volunteers, if you like, of um, members from the community to sit on the grant assessment um, committees. And it's also a really great way to, particularly for early to mid-career researchers, to really um, understand and see the depth and breadth of applications that are received. And it helps to sort of pitch future application development. Um, registering for grant opportunities, uh, Julie already mentioned this, if you haven't already, register with Grant Connect um, so you can receive alerts and if, if, if it's just MRFF and NHMRC, make sure that you're, they're your keywords and also through the standard social media ch channels such as Twitter and so forth, um, you can receive updates about the MRFF. So thank you very much for your time. I'm going to um, turn off the slides and then Julie and I will be ready to answer questions. Thanks so much, Zoraid. Really appreciate um, your presentation there. Um, I'm going to hand over now to Daniel Fadovich, who's going to moderate the Q&A um, for us. And um, hopefully you all know Daniel, um, who's the Director of, of Research with um, East Metro and Royal Perth. Um, thanks very much, Sharon, for your introduction. And uh, before I forget, I really want to thank again, uh, Julie and Zoraid, for their export, expert insights uh, into their grant funding schemes. Um, it's wonderful to have such senior experienced people who can um, help us out and uh, see if we can 
uh, improve. Um, I would sort of simply summarise much of what they've said is I think we all have to be a little bit nerdy and do our homework consistently and do all the background reading to understand the various criteria about uh, the different assessment requirements. And even if you've had success before, the conditions might change. So let's get on to the questions, which is really hopefully going to be the very interesting and helpful part. Um, before the, this started, some people sent in some questions. So I'm going to start with those, but there are other questions online already happening. Um, so I'm interested, first question is, I'm in, interested to know more about the process of how the various MRFF calls come about. Now, I think, Sarade, you've mostly covered that, but I don't know if you want to say anything else in relation to that. Yeah, no, thank you, Daniel. Um, I think in addition to what I've already said, I think some of the other things that we consider as well are pre-existing strategies that so so we, we sit within the Department of Health and uh, it also has its own priority setting across a number of various areas. So, for example, if there is the development of a mental health strategy or a, um, an Indigenous health strategy, we try to align with those strategies where we can when there's a research focus. So they are some other ways of um, identification of priority areas for investment. As I mentioned, it all still has to sit underneath the strategy and the priority areas. Um, but then I guess the granular detail of what the actual grant opportunity and the questions that we're asking, how does that get determined, that will be through a number of mechanisms. So the missions are a little bit different because that's already happened. Um, but for the other initiatives, such as the Early to Mid Career Researcher Initiative, for example, as I mentioned, that evolved from, um, through a workshop uh, or several workshops and sort of feedback from the sector. And so there are a number of different, different mechanisms that we go through to um, identify particular research calls. Thanks, Sarade. And uh, I'm going to move on to the next uh, question. And consumer engagement is obviously an important um, criterion these days. So somebody sent in this question, which I think will be open to both of you. What does it mean to answer about community engagement when it's a trial developed for ICU, intensive care unit, and incapacitated patients? Yeah, I saw this question come through last night. It's um, it, it's a really tricky one, but I mean, I think if you spoke to uh, an expert in, in community and consumer engagement, um, they, they would talk about the the fact that it, there's no point sort of doing the research without understanding what are the what are the research priorities and getting um, the consumer and community view right from the beginning. So, um, and that could include you know people who are family members or people who've been affected by the the sorts of things that you're talking about. So, really, I mean it it varies across the schemes, but um, NHMRC has a strong commitment to ensuring that it. Uh, researchers incorporate that input and involve consumers and community groups throughout the process, not not just sort of at the end or or at worst. You know, we we've got communities uh, engagement because we're we're you know we're funding research into people, so <laughs> that's not what we mean. But Sarade, I don't know if you had anything to add to that. Yeah, look, I think it's the same, and and look, it's a really it's an excellent question, and um and I think this is part of the evolution of that strong focus of having consumer engagement and and this is where we're partially the the sector the research sector and as funders we're learning as we go um, but i think as julie mentioned it's it's it consumer engagement is is beyond necessarily just the individual so it is that the network that sits around them so for in instances such as this um, i would imagine it would be the network but it is also from the get-go. It's not consumer engagement sort of as a tokenistic approach. And if I can just add, uh, many people will know that in WA, we have a very strong community engagement program via the consumer and community involvement program through the University of Western Australia. So um, I would recommend that they kind of get them involved. 
Uh, all right, so I've still got some more questions that were sent in beforehand. Um, this one is, can you please provide some information about grants available to those who run research around the following topics? And they've given three. So there's non-pharmacologic interventions, community-based research, for example, working with service providers, employment for neurodevelopmental conditions, and then three, out-of-hospital research. So I think, sorry, um, so I think there, um, and I don't have the slides in front of me, but that last slide that I showed, or one of the last slides I showed about the current grant opportunities that are open, there are a few in there that I think would be applicable um, to some of those areas identified. And one that sort of comes to mind is the 2022 Dementia, Ageing and Aged Care grant opportunity, which has some priority areas identified in there that I think would align with some of those. Um, there's also, uh, depending upon the actual grant opportunity priority area focus, but under our preventive and um, public health initiative and our primary um, health care initiative, there's also grant opportunities that often address some of those areas that were identified in that question. Okay, and Julie, did you want to add anything? Yeah, look, I think that the types of schemes, um, so as I said, most of our schemes are generic, so they'll support research across any areas, but um, have uh, just a suggestion to have a look at the partnership project scheme, um, which might be uh, useful um, for some of those areas of research as well. So I've got a couple more that were sent in beforehand, but obviously there's a pretty juicy one that you've seen online, which you were probably expecting to receive. Uh, I assume Julie and Saraid, you can read that question online uh, about, about the researchers in WA feel that they're disadvantaged. Yeah. Yeah, look, I'm, I'm happy to kick off uh, with that one. Um, so I guess, you, you know, when I put that the first slide up, um, the way that we allocate funding, so we don't, allocate funding to particular states or territories or or even particular research areas. We don't sort of quarantine funding across those lenses. We really do uh, fund, um, you know, the highest scoring applications, uh, you know, and run and run down the ranked list. So this is a question that comes up, not not, you know, not always the state lens, but um, this sort of question comes up a lot because our, as Sarayd mentioned in her um, presentation, our schemes are incredibly competitive. And so in order to be funded, uh, as she mentioned, you need to be getting fives, uh, at least fives across all the criteria. So I think um, some of the areas and professional research areas that have had a big impact, impact in improving their scores um, is by uh, employing doing workshops like this, for example, so this is a great initiative, um, getting people together to talk about the, um, to talk about their research proposals, getting them together to workshop through and mentor with other peer reviewers um, to improve the quality of the application. So I'm not saying that um, there, there are fantastic applications coming out of WA. Um, uh, I think um, Daniel is a recipient of one of those such grants, but um, you know, I guess it, it really is about what can be done to um, improve the quality, to understand, and it's not always about the quality of the research, as you could have seen from what um, Sarayd and I have been talking about. It's often just about Get, hitting the mark with the peer reviewer to make sure that you've absolutely um, checked off on what the scheme is asking for. And so, um, like with anything, uh, practice having visibility, getting involved in peer review, getting support from mentors, um, getting support from colleagues uh, across bigger networks. So people who are successful, approach them and ask them. I, I'll guarantee you, most times people are successful, they've put in many grants before, many grant applications before and have responded to feedback or, or reworked or got, um, you know, reworked on the same ideas uh, to improve. So um, it's always hard. I, I, we, we really want to be able to fund everyone. Um, but yeah, um, it, it is a tricky issue. So right. Yeah, I think just following on from Julie's point, it's, it's really hard 
to see it at an individual level, these outcomes. And I think anybody who has been around for a long time will be able to say that, you know, with with every success that they have achieved, there's been many, many knockbacks. Um, but I think one thing I try to reiterate, uh, which I think is, is slightly unique for the MRFF, and I come back to the missions again, is that if this is your area of research, and the eight missions do span quite a range, um, really look at the implementation plan and look at the priority areas because, you know, it might be that, you know, you're almost sort of you're on the periphery or that's part of your research and you can really try to start to build up a strong, there's no guarantees, but at least you can see what's coming. And so, and I think sometimes that's a useful thing to what's coming up in the pipeline. Um, because you can be guaranteed that there will be some funding invested in this area. And if that's an area of your expertise, um, that's where you can start to, like Julie said, you know, those collaborations, the networks and starting those discussions. And that's really important. The, um, I, I better let everybody know we, we kind of need to wind up by quarter past one. And I'm sure we could talk about this for quite some time. The only thing that I would add to what uh, Julie and Sarade said is in my experience, it seems to me that in the Eastern States, there are a number of institutions there that seem to invest quite heavily in optimising and improve, making the grant applications as the best as possible. And, and I don't think in WA we've nailed that aspect of it, but I'm sure there are other factors as well where we could improve. I, I wanna try and get through some more questions. Uh, again, there's another couple from that were sent in before. How would a clinician researcher with some publications approach obtaining MRFF and NHMRC grants? The grants seem hinged on your past track record. The process is very daunting. Is it best to team up with experienced researchers who've been successful in the past and have good and have a good consumer voice on the research? Um, so I think uh, similar to what Julie mentioned about the change um, that's been implemented for investigator grants, I think it was where it's just the um, you select 10 of your publications and articulate why you've selected those. Uh, we adopted a similar approach last year um, where we just uh, ask for researchers to identify five for each CI to try to remove that focus on the quantity and, and shift the focus onto the quality. And um, whilst our numbers are much smaller in terms of applications received and funded compared to NHMRC, um, we, we do see some diversity coming through in those that we're funding. Um, and so we're hoping that that's a partial contributor to that so that, and, and, and through the advice that we provide to our assessors, it is about the complementarity of the research team um, to address the question at hand. And it's not necessarily about having a, you know, um, a really high achiever, but it's about the complementation of the, that team in front of you. Yes, it's, I, I describe research, contemporary research is very much a team sport. Mm -hmm. It's not about an individual. Yeah. Um, I'll move on. Um, it's fantastic to see the um, early to mid-career research around from the MRFF. This means a lot to early and mid-career stages. I was interested to know if this would become a regular call or if any other calls would try to implement this focus on EMCRs in the leadership team of CIs. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, so I guess you can see, um, so that was the new initiative that was announced as part of the budget. So there's ongoing funding for this initiative. Now, what each grant opportunity will look like might vary slightly, but the focus will always be on early to mid-career researchers. So you can be guaranteed for the next 10 years, there will be that ongoing funding that is dedicated to EMCRs. I'm sure that's music to the ears of many uh, of the EMCRs online. Um, somebody's asked, do you need to have an account on Grant Connect to access the resources you were discussing? Yeah. 
Um, yes, yeah, so most of the things that I spoke about were are available through Grant Connect. Some of them are available on our website, but for the most comprehensive, I would absolutely recommend a Grant Connect um, account. I know some institutions though, uh, some of the universities download those documents and put them on their own website. So if you're in an institution, mm -hmm. you may not need an account, but you'll miss out on getting the alerts if there's an FAQ. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, can I can I just following on from that, uh, which is it's really important that you sign up to it because I think what people may not realise is that while NHMRC and MRFF combined, um, we have a big budget, but there's still a lot of funding that comes from other resources. And so, for example, the Department of Health itself um, puts out a lot of funding through various research projects. So it's really important to sign up to Grant Connect because that's your one stop shop that um, really highlights all of the grant opportunities that um, are made available. Okay, and um, it's 10 past one. Um, Julian uh, Sarraid, I'm assuming you can see the uh, live Q&A. Um, there's kind of a bit of a follow-up question there uh, in relation to the WA situation um, I don't know if you're able to make any comment in relation to that. Uh, uh, is that Glenn's question there? Yeah. I think so, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, look, it is, um, it is something that I think every other state raises with us about Victoria. Um, I, I think, and I think, Daniel, I think when we were talking about this uh, earlier, there, there, there can sometimes be a um, success begets success kind of thing where, um, you know, people tend to move to institutions that have, mm -hmm. uh, you know, good success. But I mean, in saying that, I, I think that the schemes are competitive, but um, there are there is research funded throughout Australia. So we, we don't um, we certainly haven't written into any of our criteria that you need to be in you know one of the Australia's leading institutions to receive funding that's not an element of the assessment so um, great researchers can be funded um, wherever you are I, I will say that um, our we've just had a refresh of our committees uh, in the NH and MRC and the 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 area of rural, rural and regional research has been raised as a as a real priority so I know that's something we will be looking at um, to make sure you, uh, we all know that health outcomes tend to be better um, in cities because of access to the health and um, to the health facilities, but um, also research uh, in cities and, and being involved in clinical trials, um, it, it can also be very metropolitan. So I know MRFF has also got some initiatives um, thinking, trying to breadth, you know, broaden that out and make sure that rural and regional Australia is, is part of that um, high quality research that's being funded as well. Okay, well, I think we should probably start winding up. Um, Mel's just put in a thing there about, um, uh, will the slides be available after the session? Um, I'm assuming, Julie and Sarade, you're happy for your slides to be a part of the resources available? Thank you. So look, uh, I need to wind up. So once again, thanks very much, Julian Sarade, for such an informative um, information session, which I hope uh, people have found very helpful. I'm sure they will. And um, I also want to thank Sharon Humphreys and Mark Woodman, who did the behind the scenes stuff to help make this happen, because this just doesn't happen by itself. And um, I'm hoping that yourselves may or may not be available in the future for something similar, because um, it's always good to, to revisit this. Um, for the people that attended, um, if you want to provide some feedback ab about this session, what was good or bad, you can email Sharon or Mark and um, see, uh, let us know what you think. And also if, if after today you think, oh, I should have asked, this other really important question, Julian Sarraid, uh, very happy for us to forward questions to them subsequently. And I, I know we've all got your email addresses through the registration process. So there's, there's a way of disseminating that information. And I also want to make a plug for 
we're having another session similar to this in May. You'll get an email uh, where we're uh, hearing about the Future Health Research Innovation Fund, a West Australian fund that uh, researchers uh, can access. So, um, Sharon, is there anything else I need to say, or can we just say the meet the session is closed? Um, I'm pretty sure we can close the session. Thanks, Daniel. Okay. Thanks very much, everyone, and we really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye.